In the previous session on classification trees, we talked about how to grow a tree. Now let's talk about how we can use the tree for several objectives, and then we'll talk about the critical issue of avoiding overfitting the training data. One very nice use of trees is for variable selection. In other words, detecting which are the good predictors. Remember that we can actually see which predictors play a major role in the tree by simply finding out which predictors appear in the tree. In the example that we saw earlier on, we used a bunch of different predictors, but only two of them showed up in our tree, age in years and income. What we can see here is that not only do these two predictors show up, but that they show up multiple times. Age shows up at the first node and also later down, and income shows up at multiple places as well. In general, the tree might look a little bit bigger with more layers in it, but the predictors that show up at the very top layers are going to be the major predictors. So we can look at the tree and just by looking at the predictors that show up at the top of the tree, detect which are the most informative variables to keep. Now, we talked about the tree being an interpretable classifier. And the reason is that we can convert this tree into a set of if-then rules. For example, if we take this particular tree here, we can convert the predictor to output information in the following fashion. I can say that if age is above 42 and a half years and income is below 41,173, then I'm more likely to prefer regular beer. So I can write this in the form if age is above 42 and a half and income is below 41,173, then regular beer. I can do the same thing for each one of the terminal nodes. So each terminal node will generate a rule. So for example, I can go to the younger people and look at the lower income of these younger people and find the label regular in the tree node. Now, you'll notice that by just creating a list of rules based on all the terminal nodes, you might get some redundancies. For example, these two rules that we just looked at can be condensed in saying we don't really care how old you are. If your income is below $34,375 a year, then you're really going to prefer regular beer because both of these terminal nodes had a label of regular. So there's an extra step that you want to do besides just the mechanical conversion of a terminal leaf into a rule, and that is condensing rules. Now, if someone asks you, hey, why did you serve me regular beer? It's quite easy to go back to the rule and say, oh, because your income is lower than $34,000. Now, you might have noticed on the previous tree, and let me flip back for a minute, that some of the labels here are actually duplicate. We see that income down here is split into two subgroups, but we have two labels that are light. And in general, how do I determine the labels on the terminal nodes? So one obvious thing to do is to just have a majority vote of all the records in each terminal node. And if I have a two class case, such as regular and light beer, then obviously using a majority vote is equivalent to using a cutoff of 0 0.5. If I want a stronger majority, then I can set the cutoff to different values. Note that I can change the cutoff value, and that would change the labels that show up on those terminal nodes. And that's why in our previous tree, although we had two nodes that led to the same label, that not necessarily would be the case if we change the cutoff value. The cutoff value might change the leaf node on one of them, but not on the other. That's why the software still keeps the split, but shows us the same node. Another use of the tree is obviously to classify existing or new records. And to do that, we can do something very simple. We take the new record and simply drop it down the tree. So we ask the questions that the nodes are asking us. We ask the person, how old are you? And then based on their age, we go right or left. Then we ask about their income and go right or left. And when we reach a final terminal node, we use the label in that node to generate the classification for that record. For example, try to see if you can predict the beer preference of a 50-year-old female who has a $50,000 income. 
how are we going to do this? Let's drop her down. She's 50 years old, so we're dropping her to the right, and she has a higher income than 41,000, so she's going again to the right. However, now we're going to go left because she's younger than 51 and a half years old, and therefore her preference is most likely going to be light beer. One last note, although we talked about how to generate the leaf node labels, you might note that if we want a probability of referring light beer, we can simply use the proportion of light beer drinkers in this particular node. So the proportions would be our estimates of probabilities. Let us now go into the important issue of avoiding overfitting. If we keep splitting the tree and building more and more and more nodes based on the training set, we're going to be overfitting the training set, meaning that the tree won't perform very well on new data that it never saw before. Think of it this way, the further down you go on the tree, you're splitting into smaller and smaller subsets, so the results are less and less reliable. The main problem is that very large trees are going to lead to high prediction variance, meaning that your predictions are not going to be precise. So our goal is to create the smallest possible tree that predicts sufficiently accurately for our purposes. Let's see how we can do that. There are a few different approaches. One approach is to look at the performance of the tree on the training data, that's the blue line here, as we add more and more splits as our tree becomes larger. And compare that to the performance of the tree on unseen data, on a holdout set. Again, as we increase the tree, how well are we performing on unknown data? At some point where, we, where we're beginning to overfit the training data, we'll see that the unseen data is not going to like any more splits in our tree. And finding this cut point is where we really want to stop. Now, there are a few ways to trying to find when we're overfitting. One approach is to start constructing the tree, split, 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 until you stop somewhere. And in order to stop, you're going to need some, some kind of rule or criterion. There are a bunch of different criteria that you'll see in software, such as how many levels of the tree you should have, what's called tree depth. Or maybe you want to limit it so that the terminal nodes won't have fewer than a certain number of records. Or maybe you want to set some kind of a threshold on how much reduction you want in impurity in order to conduct another, another split. All these are ad hoc, and it's very difficult to find general rules for all data sets. So that's why these are good to have in the background, but really what you want is something more generic. An approach that uses the idea of stopping tree growth is called CHADE. And that's short for Chi-Square Automatic Interaction Detector. The idea behind CHADE, which is the original tree before all the fancier data mining fast algorithms came in, was not to use an impurity measure, but instead to use a statistical test called the Chi-Square test to test the independence between the outcome and predictors. And the idea there is that when we find dependence, it means that the predictor is informative of the Y. But if they're independent, then that predictor or that split is going to be useless. The idea of CHADE is that at each node, we're going to split on the predictor with the strongest association with Y. How do we measure the strength of association? By this statistic called a chi-square, and there's going to be statistical significance associated with it. When do we stop splitting? Splitting terminates when no more association is found between the predictors and the outcome. Now, to run CHADE, your predictors are going to need to be categorical, because the chi-square test tests a relationship between two categorical variables. The Y is categorical, but your predictor is also going to need to be categorical. CHADE is quite popular in marketing, perhaps because they were the earlier users of trees even before they came very, very popular in data mining. This is one approach to avoiding overfitting by growing the tree until you stop when there seems to be no more information in the predictors. A completely different solution, which is more automated and today integrated into many more software packages, is called pruning. And the idea there is to grow the tree all the way down, meaning overfit your training data, and then start snipping back many of the branches of the tree so that we end up with a smaller tree that doesn't overfit. 
So here's how pruning works. We talked earlier on about comparing the performance of the training data and the validation data. How well does a tree perform on both of these sets? The pruning is going to do this by looking at the tree that you're building and evaluating its performance not only on the training data, but also on the validation set, what we call the holdout data. Pruning works so that we build the tree all the way down, and then we start snipping back the tree until we reach the point where we're actually performing optimally on the holdout data. There's more detail on the exact pruning method in the textbook, but the idea is to define some kind of an overall training error measurement. So not only looking at how well you're fitting the training data, but also put some kind of a penalty that is a function of the size of the tree. Although you might be fitting the training data better and better, you're also penalizing yourself by having a bigger and bigger tree. Let me show you an example of fitting a full tree and then compare it to the prune tree. If I just run a full tree where I fit the tree and keep splitting until I have no more splits on the beer data, I get this tree here on the left. And you'll notice that we have one, two, three, four, five, six terminal nodes. In contrast, if I prune the tree back, in other words, I ask myself which one of these splits is actually creating worse predictive accuracy on the holdout set, then I get the prune tree right here. And you'll notice that we no longer have a split that used to be here in the full tree. So our prune tree is almost always going to be much simpler than the full tree. This example is very small. It has only 100 records and a very small number of predictors. But when we're in bigger examples, then the difference between the full tree and the prune tree is going to be much bigger. Let's get back to our personal loan offer example where a bank is trying to um, create an algorithm for determining who to send out a new offer to. And in this example, they're using data from the previous campaign, which was sent out to 5,000 customers, out of which 480 people accepted the offer. I'll remind you that we had information about demographics of the customers and about their banking um, behaviors, and our outcome variable of interest is whether they accepted or not accepted, which is the variable personal loan. When I run the tree on this larger data set, I get a full tree that's quite intricate. And in fact, you're not seeing the entire tree here because it's too big. And you can see that Excel Miner um, writes subtree beneath to denote that this actually continues on. Note that to evaluate the performance of the tree, I can get confusion matrices if I'm interested in classification. Or of course, I can get lift charts if I'm interested in ranking. What I want you to note here is the differences between performance on the training data validation data, and test data. Just like in K-nearest neighbors, where we're using the validation data to determine K, in trees, we're using the validation data to determine the amount of pruning. And therefore, the validation data are, are no longer objective. And to evaluate performance on a new set of data, we really need to look at performance on a fresh test data that was not used at all. Now, look at the error levels. This is the full tree, and this full tree generates 0% error for the training data. This means we're completely overfitting the training data. How well does this algorithm work on the validation data? Well, it generates an error of about 2%. Note that it is much worse at classifying the one labels than it is the zero labels. And how about test data? Well, test data are about the same level of the validation data. Can you think why here we don't have a difference between performance on the validation and test sets? Now let's look at the prune tree. So once we use the validation data to prune back that big tree, we get a much simpler tree here with much fewer terminal nodes. In addition to the confusion matrices, we'll also get an output showing us how the pruning was chosen. And you can see that this is the number of terminal leaves. You can see that as it decreases, the training error gets worse. In other words, the training data really want you to have the maximum number of splits, which will yield 0% error, in other words, total overfitting. 
but the validation set does not like 41 nodes. If you look at the error rate, it starts decreasing and decreasing until we reach 11, and then it starts increasing again. Now, we can stick with the 1.4 here, or if we want to allow some flexibility, because we're not exactly sure if 1.46 has some randomness, and maybe it's similar to 1.6, we can actually add and subtract a standard deviation. And that's why there's also something called the best prune tree. You can see here, this is the best prune tree. And you can see that the resulting tree that we have is the best prune tree that has one, two, three, four, five, six decision nodes. Now compare the performance on the validation and the test, and you'll see that again, they're quite similar, but if you compare the errors here, the performance of the validation is a tiny bit better. And that's expected because remember that the validation data are used to determine this pruning. To close, let me keep you thinking about the following question. And let's discuss this on the forum. Why is the performance of the full tree and the prune tree similar on the test data for this particular example? Look at the confusion matrices on the bottom here. This is for the full tree and this is for the best prune tree. And think about why we're getting performance that is really quite similar.